But right now, would you just say, God, give me ears to hear your word. Give me a heart that is ready to receive. In Jesus' name. And everyone will shout, Amen. For the past few weeks, we've been in a series on the power of perspective. The power of perspective. The power of how we view the life that we live and the world around us. I was thinking this morning that when we talk about salvation, many times we limit it to eternal life. And although eternal life is the end game, although eternal life is something that we should all look forward to, the gospel is more than just a destination. It's all about giving you a new life with a fresh perspective so that you can do what God has called you to do. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are here for a purpose. You're not here by accident. There is something that God wants you to do. But the only way you can walk into what God has called for you is to see it clearly. Somebody say, I've got to see it clearly. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, the Bible tells us that the enemy has blinded our minds. He's darkened our understanding. He's hidden from us the truth that we find in the gospel. But Jesus came to pull us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. What does that mean? What I could not see, I now can see because Jesus has opened my eyes. I am not who I used to be. I am not where I came from. I now walk in light. I see. I have a fresh perspective. And so that's what this series is all about, is starting to see things the way God sees them. We want to look at marriage from God's perspective. We want to look at challenges and obstacles from God's perspective. Today, we're going to talk about the way we view ourselves. Today, we're going to talk about self-perspective And I want you to understand that this is very important because it will shape our reality. The way you view yourself will determine how you respond and react to life. For instance, yesterday I was with my family and I was telling my daughters that basketball season is coming up and I want them to start practicing. I want them to start doing their drills. I want them to start doing their dribbling and their passing and their shooting. I want them to start getting ready for the upcoming season so that when tryouts come, they're ready to do the best they can do. Now, when you tell someone something like that, you have to understand that they are going to filter that information through the way they view themselves. So one perspective of that could be, dad doesn't think I'm any good. It could become a discouragement to them to where they quit and give up. Why? Not because of what I said, but because of the way they view themselves. Whereas another child may hear it, dad sees great potential in me, and he's wanting to pull it out of me because he knows that I can do better than I did last season. He knows that I can excel. And I want you to understand this, that many times when God brings a truth to you, he is doing it to better you. He does not chastise you to crush you. He chastises you to pull you into something better because he sees your potential. If he did not see your potential, he would not waste his time with you. Hello. So today I want to talk about how we view ourselves. A few months ago, we did a series in the book of Judges, and uh, one of the messages that we did was on Gideon, where we talked about him being a warrior in a wine press, all because of the way he viewed himself. Today, I want to go back to that story, and I want to make this kind of a part two of that message. And today, the title is going to be The Lens of My Label. Somebody say, The Lens of My Label. So if you have your Bible, go to Judges, the sixth chapter. We're going to read five verses out of this. And I want to let you know that on 
our website, you can find a link to a page called Who I Am in Christ or Who You Are in Christ. We also put a link to that on our Facebook page because I believe it would be helpful for you to get into seeing what God actually says about you. I believe there are 30 different statements with scriptures. You can take one a day and meditate on it. I would suggest taking one per week and every day just chewing on what God has said about you and allowing that to frame your perspective of yourself. But Judges, the sixth chapter, starting in verse 11, <clears throat> the Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? I want you to start paying attention to Gideon's perspective. If God is with us, if God is for us, then why are we currently in the situation that we are in? He says, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. Hear that. This is Gideon's view of the situation he is in. The Lord has forsaken us. The Lord has abandoned us. But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan, my family, my people is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man there's a tug of war happening between God's perspective and Gideon's perspective I many I wonder how many of you today are wrestling between what God has said and what you feel I wonder how many of you on a daily basis wrestle between what God has said about you and what you are saying about yourself. How many of you have that inner voice? What is your inner voice saying about you? What is your inner voice saying about your current situation? That would be what we would call your perspective, your outlook of who you are, what you're doing, and where you are heading. Today I brought some things with me that I wanted to show you. Can somebody tell me, can y'all see what this is? Can somebody tell me what that is? No. Come here, Justin. Just read to me and to the people what, you, what it is. Wasabi and soy sauce, almonds. Wasabi and soy sauce, almonds. What, what you got? Almonds, salt and vinegar. Salt and vinegar. Almonds. What do you got here? So you got honey roasted almonds. Honey roasted almonds. Thank you, uh, Justin, for your help. I know what you're thinking right now. That's nuts. <laughs> it's interesting, though, when Justin came up here and looked at these. He didn't just say they are almonds, but he went the extra step to label them honey roasted, 
salt and vinegar, wasabi, and soy sauce. The truth is, they all probably came from the same almond farm. They were probably all canned in the same almond factory. They were probably all shipped, maybe even, on the same truck that landed in the same store. However, when we look at them, we no longer see almond. We see the process that it has been through. We no longer see the fact that it is an almond. We now label it by what it has been through. It has been through the process of being smoked. So it is a smoked almond. It's gone through the process of the wasabi and soy. So now it's not just an almond. It's a wasabi and soy almond. The problem is many times we, myself included, do this with our life. We no longer see who we truly are. We no longer see what we were created for because we are allowing a label to identify us, a label of something that maybe that has happened to us, a label of something that maybe someone has said about us. Maybe it's an experience that we have encountered, a trial or a trauma. It becomes a label. The problem is whatever label you allow to attach itself to you will be the label you The label you allow to attach itself to you will be the label you filter your entire life through. And your label creates a boundary that you will live within. I remember years ago when I was a kid, I had just started playing the bass guitar, and there was this guy that was a very accomplished musician. I really looked up to him. I really respected his ability. And I had done some recordings, and somehow they landed in his hands. And when he heard the recording, he immediately started tearing me down. Not to my face. How many of you know people don't typically say what they feel to your face? But he started talking about how I was no good, how I shouldn't even play, how I should just give up. That was his opinion of me. That becomes a label if I receive it. I didn't. I went on to stand on stages in front of thousands of people to play on television, to produce albums, to be on the radio. Why? Because I did not allow that label to attach itself to me. Had I allowed that label to attach itself to me, who knows? I may have never played again. Are you following what I'm saying? How many of you today are bound by the label you have received? Not the truth that you've received, but the label that you have received. You've allowed everyone and everything to attach all of these things to you. You're abandoned, you're worthless, you're broken, you're stupid, all of these things are are things that we have all probably heard at some point in time. The question is, how many of you believe that? See, Gideon is actually a warrior created by God, designed by God for greatness, but he has positioned himself in a place of hiding because of the label he has received. He sees himself as worthless, and so he does worthless things. He sees himself as weak, and so he does what weak people do. He sees himself as a coward, and so he does what cowards do. Are you following what I'm saying? Why? Because the label you receive will filter everything you do in your life. Some of you are having problems within your relationships because of the label you received. Some of you have problems on the job site because of the label that you're living by. The question I want to ask today is, how do you view yourself? What label have you attached to yourself? And does it line up with the way God 
sees you. Turn to the person next to you and say, does it line up with the way God sees you? What is the source of your identity? Now, many of the things that we're going to mention today, we're just going to hit them in bullet points. It's something that you've got to take and process through because I cannot answer those questions for you. It's something I can only answer for myself. I can only go through my life and start determining how do I view myself. Do I view myself as a victim or do I view myself as victorious? Do I view myself as weak or do I view myself as a warrior? You know, I hear people a lot now talking about how bad the world is. How many of you turned on the news and you would agree? They talk about how bad the world is how everything's spiraling out of control. I can either look at this situation and circumstance that we are in globally and see myself as a victim of it, or I can view myself as someone that God has placed in the midst of it to bring change. The biblical perspective is actually that God has placed me right here, right now, for a reason. To bring heaven to earth. The reason we are experiencing so many things in this world that are negative is because the church has not understood who God has called them to be. And so instead of bringing change, we bring complaints. Instead of standing firm in the spirit and being led by the spirit of God, we're being led by our feelings. Instead of allowing the word to guide our path, we allow the world and the culture to guide us and we become a victim of the circumstance instead of the one who God has actually placed there to bring change. That is exactly what's happening with Gideon. He's hiding in a wine press to protect his wheat from an enemy that God had created him to destroy. Think about that. He was created to be the solution to Israel's problem, but he didn't see it that way. He saw himself as a victim. He saw himself as weak. He saw himself as abandoned because Midian has now come in and oppressed Israel. All of these things are true, by the way. Midian has come in. Midian has oppressed Israel. But Gideon's perspective is completely wrong on the matter. See, he sees this this oppression as an abandonment of God, whereas actually the perspective is this. God told Israel, don't turn your back on me. Don't go after other gods, because if you do, it's going to be bad for you. Israel didn't listen. Israel went after other gods. They forgot about God. They actually abandoned God. God didn't abandon them. And because of their faithlessness, God allowed Midian to come in and oppress Israel. But it was not for their crushing. It was for their betterment. So that Israel would go, oh my goodness, we've got to cry back out to God. And when we cry out to God, God will show up on the scene. And everything's going to start going better for us. See, it was the love of God that allowed Midian to come in. See, that's all perspective. When you walk through something in life, how you view it, is this something that is here to crush me or something that is here to propel me? Scripturally, every problem that you face is either growing you or preparing you. Are are you following what I'm saying? Even the bad things that are allowed is because of God's love to bring you into a better truth, knowing that if I just allow you to follow the course that you are on, eventually it's going to wind up in destruction. So because I love you, I'm going to allow an enemy to come in and oppress you so that you call out to me. And when you call out to me, I want you to know that I've already prepared a way for you in a person named Gideon. Perspective. Perspective. Somebody say perspective. Are you seeing how powerful your perspective is? It will determine how you walk through different seasons of your life. How you view it will determine how you walk through it, and sometimes how you view it will determine how long you have to stay in the middle of it. 
That's a big truth. This morning we were praying with some of the gentlemen before church and I said, God, let us learn our lessons and let us learn them quickly. (laughs) I don't want to be stubborn because I know that God loves me enough to stay on me until I go, okay, I surrender, I cry out. And the quicker I cry out, the quicker I can step through this thing that God's trying to teach me. Perspective. Somebody say perspective. So the question is, what is the source of your identity? Is it what you have been through? Is it the trauma in your life? Is it your job? Is it a relationship? Because your, your life will flow from whatever your source is. The problem is, if your identity is all about a job, what happens when that job exits your life? If your identity is built all around a relationship, a husband, a wife, a friendship, what happens if they exit your life? If your identity is built around being a father or a mother, what happens when your children grow up and leave the home? Are you seeing this? It's very important where we place the root of our identity. What is the source of our identity? I want to encourage you today to start seeing your identity from the source of what God has said about you. Because if you can get your feet firmly planted on what God has said, it doesn't matter what changes around you, you do not shift because you are firm in who you are called to be. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, for you, this is David talking. He's talking to God. He says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb, which means you didn't evolve from a primordial soup. You were created by God. So that's, that's, that's where we need to start as a people because your point of origin will determine how you view yourself. If we came but from primordial soup that ended up becoming this, that ended up becoming this, that ended up becoming this, then we are nothing more than an animal and we can act accordingly. But if I am formed, that means that something intentional happened. I'm not here by accident. I'm here by design. Somebody hear that this morning. You are not here by accident. You are here by design. There is a purpose for your life. That's why I went back, if we go back to the beginning of what I said, the salvation is not just about getting you to a place. It's about turning your mind around and your life around so that you see who you are right now so that you can do what God has called you to do right now to bring the change that needs to be brought. But so many of us are a warrior hiding out in a wine press because we don't see it. Verse 14 of Psalm 139 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Hear that. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. (laughs) I love that. Then David goes on to say, wonderful are your works. How many of you actually feel that way about yourself? That I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and God did a really good job. Then he says, my soul knows it (laughs) very well. When I look in the mirror, I see what God has made, and I know he didn't make a mistake. He created me as a man. He created me, oh, oh my goodness. He didn't make a mistake. You were carefully thought out and intentionally made. You are not the byproduct of an intimate moment. Some people think that the only reason I'm here is because two people got together and knocked some boots. Either on purpose or accidentally, I'm here. But that's not what God says about you. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made made. You're not the byproduct of an intimate moment. You are the result of God's affection and creativity. Your identity isn't shaped by circumstance because it has already been determined 
by God. In Jeremiah, God tells him, he says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God was thinking about you from the foundation of the world. He knew you. Then he says, I called you. I set you apart for a purpose. Before you were formed, God knew you. He may have used a circumstance to get you here, but he got you here nonetheless. And he got you here at a specific time in a specific place for a specific purpose. And he consecrated you. That means he has set you apart. And everything that you've gone through in your life has been a part of that setting you apart to mold you into the person he wants you to be so that you can do what he's called you to do. Every trial you have walked through has produced something in you. Every adversary that you've gone through is doing something to produce something in you so that you can be who he's called you to be and do what he's called you to do. Stop wrestling with the sanctification process and start leaning into it, resting in it, knowing that God is trying to take you somewhere so that he can do something through you. But how many of you actually see that? How many of you actually see that you are loved and that you are valuable? How many of you actually see that you belong? I want you to understand this morning that God sees your past, God sees your present, and God sees your future. He knows who you were created to be in the past because he's the one that did it. He sees where you currently are because he cares about you. Don't ever, when you're in the wine, wine press, because there there's always going to be moments in our life where we find ourselves in the wine press or down in the dumps. Never question whether or not God's aware of where you are or if he even cares. He's closer than you even know. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to be with you in this moment. I know where you are. I care about where you are, and I want to take you into something new because I also see your future. I see the purpose that I have created for you, and I'm going to do everything I can to pull that out of you. I'm going to do everything I can for you to start seeing things the way I see it. See, the, the, what you have to understand is Gideon and God saw the same thing. They just saw it in two completely different ways. See, the whole point of this series is not about what you see. It's about the way you see what you see. If I can start seeing things from God's perspective, it'll give me fuel to move into my future because I know God's not done with me yet. What I'm in is just a season, not a life sentence. And this season is seasoning me for a purpose. And I'm coming out stronger. I'm coming out wiser. I'm coming out better because God is for me. And he who started the work is going to bring it to completion. That's perspective. That is perspective. Gideon saw himself as weak and his people abandoned. And it caused him to hide from the very thing he was created to do. You know what the enemy wants? He wants you to hide from what you were created to do. He doesn't care if you attend a church service. He doesn't care if you slap a denominational label at the front of your Christianity. All he cares about is, will they fulfill the purpose that God has placed on their life? Because your purpose is what destroys his kingdom. 
And the more he can keep you in the dark and keep you blinded, the farther you will be from the truth. And please hear what I'm saying. So many of us in this room and in this world have allowed him to blind our eyes to what is true. And we've allowed the deception to determine our reality. And we are flowing from that place. We are flowing from that place of deception, deceived about who we are, deceived about how this world works, deceived about what marriage is and how it should be. We're deceived and we're living by that deception. The prob problem is if you live by that deception, it takes you into destruction. But Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. Not just physical blindness. Many times we read that passage where he says, go tell John that the, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. And we take it as just a physical healing, and there were physical healings. But what if it's all also that he has come so that now we can see what we could not see before? Now we can hear what we could not hear before so that we can walk in what we've never walked in before. It's almost like the movie The Matrix. Y'all remember The Matrix? Where they tell them you can take this pill or you can take this pill. The goss pill. That's <laughs> those dumb preacher jokes. My dad would say, I'm addicted to the goss pill. <laughs> you can't lo lose with the stuff I use, you know. <laughs> But seriously, think about that. How many of us are choosing the pill to remain darkened in our understanding? Claiming to be wise, the Bible says, we have become fools. Because we're educated. My plead with you this morning is that you would submit your life to Christ and say, God, there are some things in my life that I have not figured out yet. I'm aware that I still have some dark places in my mind, that I'm still blinded to some things, and I want to start seeing from your perspective. I want to yield myself and surrender myself to you to be molded by you. The question I would have is, what is your hang-up from doing that today? What holds you back from full surrender to God? Could be different for every person in this room. Some fear what they will lose. Not realizing the only thing you lose is the stuff that is dragging you down and weighing you down, and you gain everything good. Not just in eternity, but now. Right here, right now, the goodness of the Lord follows me all the days of my life. Some people are scared to let go because they want to be the God of their lives. The problem is, if you're the God of your life, it ends really badly because there is no salvation from you. Only Jesus could do that. When he shed his blood for you because he loved you because he valued you because he saw your worth even when you didn't see it he said i'm going to die for them because it's the only way i can reconnect them to the purpose that they were created for it's the only way they're going to truly see their value it's the only way they're going to truly see who it is they are. If they don't see it through the lens of my blood, they're going to see it through the lens of their label. And so many of us, our life is torn in every direction because we have so many labels that we've placed on our life. And sometimes these labels just keep on getting passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. There are things that your family has wrestled with for years that now you are wrestling with because you identify with it. 
We don't have to go into specifics this morning. Again, I want you to be able to fit what you are currently in into this realm to start processing it through and thinking maybe what I am doing in life is a result of a label I have believed. I have truly believed that I am garbage, so I'm doing things that show that. I, I really have believed that I'm stupid, so I'm doing stupid things. I, I really do feel like I'm worthless, so I allow people to use me so that I can get some sense of worth and value, not realizing that when Christ came in, he makes you new, but he also brings you into a family, a place of belonging. But if you don't know that, if you don't know that you belong to the family of God, that you have been adopted, then you're going to live as an orphan, always looking for what already belongs to you. That's, that's the story of the prodigal son. He's living at his dad's house, has everything he needs, everything he can imagine, but he thinks there's something better out there. Until he goes, squanders his entire inheritance and realizes everything I needed, everything I desired, I already had. And I walked away from it. Everything you need has already been received through Jesus Christ. Value, worth, dignity, belonging, truth, love, forgiveness. All of these things are part of the package. When he brings you in, he brings you in completely. Thank you.